So now that we have a little motivation for z to the k's and why they're important, because they're eigenfunctions of discrete time, linear time invariant systems, and we've seen how an input of z to the k yields just a z to the k at scale by this h of z quantity, that gives us a clue to what a useful definition of the z transform would be. So the forward direction going from discrete time to z is pretty clear. We've actually already seen the definition when we talked about the quantity h of z. The reverse direction going from the z domain back to time domain, that requires a fair amount of more advanced mathematics than we would typically cover in an undergraduate course on signals and systems. Most textbooks will have that development, or you can probably go to Wikipedia and read about it. So we're actually not going to go through this development of how to do the inverse z-transform equation because it is more complex. We are going to state it on the following chart, but typically we're not going to explicitly evaluate this equation. We'll have some other techniques that will allow us to go from the z-domain back to the time domain. So here's the definition. The z-transform representation, so this is how we can take a time domain, discrete time signal, into the z-domain. The bilateral z-transform of the discrete time signal x of k is defined right here. So this looks just like our definition or quantity that we saw earlier called h of z, which was the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of h of k z to the minus k. So that work that we previously did was basically what told us how to define the z-transform. Notice this is called the bilateral z-transform. The bilateral z-transform sums from time minus infinity to infinity. We'll talk about something later called the unilateral z-transform that starts at time zero and goes to infinity. But typically if we say z-transform, what we mean is this bilateral z-transform quantity. This equation is how we go from the z-domain back to the time domain. If you give me x of z, theoretically I can plug into this integral right here and get out x of k. Now one thing you'll notice is this integral looks kind of funny. It's not a typical integral symbol. This is an integral with a circle right here. So that's something most undergraduates have not seen. This is what's called a contour integral. And it's a contour integral because we're actually evaluating this complex valued function and we're evaluating it on a contour in the complex plane. And that is something that's typically handled in either upper level undergraduate math majors will deal with or you would do that even in graduate school in a complex analysis class. You would get into things like residue theory and how do you actually go about evaluating this type of an integral. I've stated it here for completeness just so you can see what it looks like, but this is not something that we're going to plug into and explicitly evaluate in this class. We are going to have methods where if I give you x of z, you can go from x of z back to x of k, but that method will not involve plugging into this integral. But for completeness, it is nice to have both of these on the same chart. Here's how you go from discrete time to z. Here's how you go from z back to discrete time. And then finally, some of the notation that we use for these types of transforms, very similar to the notation that we use for Fourier transforms and discrete time Fourier transforms. We like using this double arrow notation. This indicates that we're going from one domain to the other. Sometimes we'll put a little z above it just to make it clear, although usually from the context when it's an x of z over here, it's very clear what transform took us from one domain to the other. We use this bilateral z transform for what I call general signals. So unless otherwise stated, if I say z transform, what I really mean is the bilateral z transform. However, since we often deal with signals that are causal, you know, things that start at time zero and then go to the right, if we are dealing with signals like that, we can define another quantity called the unilateral z-transform, and that makes life a little bit easier when we start having to worry about region of convergence and some things that we'll see here on the uh, coming slides. But for now, we're just sticking with the bilateral z-transform as a special case when dealing with causal signals. We will talk about the unilateral z-transform, but we won't do that right now. I already mentioned that explicitly evaluating that inverse z-transform contour integral is difficult, and that's not something we're going to do in this class. But we are going to find ways to do the inversion through something called partial fraction expansion. If you remember back to your Laplace transform days, when you dealt with continuous time signals, you did something called partial fraction expansion, so you could go from the s domain back to the continuous time domain. We're going to do something very similar here, We'll do partial fraction expansion in the z-domain so we can look at the z-domain quantities and get back to the discrete time domain.
All right, so that wraps up the definition of the Z-transform. We already had some motivation for why we want to use it, and we've talked about some notation. The next thing we need to talk about is some convergence issues associated with the Z-transform. We have this sum that goes from k equals minus infinity to infinity of x of k z to the minus k. So anytime you see a sum like that, that sum from minus infinity to infinity, you would probably ask yourself, you know, is this thing going to converge? So we need to talk about some things related to convergence now.